On today's episode, we're sitting down with a Power 5 college athletics director, and we'll be talking about trends in college athletics and leadership. From Engagement, I'm David Millay, and this is Flip the Switch. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Flip the Switch, where we sit down with leaders in customer experience and employee experience, and we try to figure out what are the trends that they're paying attention to? What are the experiments that they're running? What are the principles that have driven success for them throughout their career? And then we take all those insights and we apply them to the world of sports and entertainment. Now, we have been on a run lately interviewing leaders in college athletics because as engagement, That's a lot of the work that we do is we spend time working with college athletic departments hand in hand, figuring out ways for them to more deeply engage and connect with the people that they serve to ultimately generate more revenue. Now, today we are sitting down with Jamie Pollard, the director of athletics at Iowa State University. Jamie has been there for 17 years and in those 17 years has completely reimagined almost every facet of the program including setting records for attendance and ticket sales, which we'll talk about in this episode, uh, leading them to some of their highest finishes in the Athletic Directors' Cup. He really has done a great job putting Iowa State on the map. So we are going to talk about a number of different things in this episode together. The first part of the episode, we're really going to be talking about trends and experiments that they have been running uh, in the world of college athletics. In the second half of the episode, we're more so going to dive into Jamie's leadership style. So without further ado, let's jump into this episode with Jamie Pollard. Jamie, welcome to the show. Glad to be on. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to jump in with this episode with you and this deep conversation here. But I want to start us off. Congratulations on breaking the record for number of season tickets sold at Iowa State. Um, Talk to us a little bit about how you guys got there, because I know you, you had a great year last year, but it couldn't have been just about the product on the field. Talk to us about why you guys feel like you broke the record this year in season tickets. Well, it, David, it's been a continual buildup, and it could go back years to you know when we first started investing in the program, where I, we went fan first and did concourses, restrooms, concessions, video boards, and it's been a really well thought out. I think plan that allowed us to be ready when the team got better, that we would have a foundation to capitalize on. And, you know, you mentioned last year and, you know, I've said to people, we picked the best possible year to be good. When you think about what happened during COVID, you know, our business, the entertainment business side of our business, you know, we basically sent all our customers away for a year. Mm -hmm. And when you send your customers away, it's really hard to get them back. And so, you know, we fortunately were really good last year. So it, what it did, David, is it created this uh, environment where folks felt like they were, uh, they missed out on something in person. And so it created this huge wave of pent up excitement coming into the season. And, and then we had everybody back. So you knew you were going to have a good product this year. And so I think those two things came together in a great, you know, just confluence of, uh, of a situation that it created, a, you know, a, an incredible surge of folks wanting to be here in the stadium. What were some of the, maybe the, the more strategic things that you guys did to get fans back and make sure that they felt like they were welcome back in the venue? And you mentioned, you mentioned going fans first with the concourses and the restrooms. Tell us a little bit more about what that strategy looked like. Well, you know, I mean, I'm dating myself. I've been here 17 years. So if I go back 15 years, um, you know, it, this stadium was a sleepy, old, tired little stadium that had four grass hills, had you know bleachers set up in the end zones. There was probably more porta potties inside the stadium than outside the stadium. Um, the concourses were just really narrow. Um, you know, there was one little video board that looked like the sides of a postage stamp. Um, you know, I wasn't here for it, but there were rumors of they used to bring hot tubs in on the hills to try to, you know, to make it seem like it was vibrant. Um, (laughs) And so it it needed an overhaul from top to bottom. And so we kind of, you know, built from the way out and just said, you know, we're ever going to have great crowds. 
uh, then we need to build an infrastructure that can handle that. And so, you know, when I think back to our first couple projects that we did, you know, it was blocking and tackling. You know, it was expanding the concourse, putting the concessions outboard, um, you know, creating more restrooms, bowling in the stadium, uh, you know, bringing in video boards, putting two video boards in on each end of the stadium, overhauling the sound system. There were just things we needed to do that were, you know, fundamental blocking and tackling that you needed to do if you ever were going to have 60,000 people. Back then, you know, getting 25,000 people at a game was a big crowd. Right. And so, you know, here we sit that we have 50,000 season ticket holders and we're selling, you know, we're sold out at 61,500. It's hard to think back to those days, but, you know, that's what we felt we needed to do. And then our fans responded to it. As, as the leader making those decisions, were, were those ideas to work on this kind of fans first mentality, were those ideas brought up to you or is that coming down from you down to your, uh, your support team? Well, I think there were two things, you know, one, the team that came in with me 17 years ago, you know, had a footprint from the university of Wisconsin and many of them had been part of watching that happen at Wisconsin. You know, everybody today looks at camp Randall and says, you know, oh, it's been like that forever. I mean, I grew up up there. And so, you know, I remember when the Badgers scored first on Minnesota or Michigan and lost 70 to three, you know, but we're up three, nothing and no one was at those games. And so, you know, that blueprint we were able to kind of bring here and say, you know, this is something we want to duplicate, but it, it takes more than that, because if that was the case, then you'd say, well, why can't somebody go do that in a Mac school? Right. Right. Because, you know, they have that kind of attendance. So just build facilities and, you know, like kind of like the field of dreams, build it and they will come. But, um, you know, what Iowa state had is they had a really passionate fan base, but a lot of that fan base loved to be out in the tailgate parking lots, you know, and, and didn't make their way into the game. And so, you know, that was another thing we embraced. We worked with campus to say, let's embrace tailgating, you know? So if the RVs are going to be here on Friday night, why don't we let them come on Thursday night? Mm. And why do we make them leave Saturday after the game? Let them stay to Sunday. You know, if that's what they want to do, let them do it. And, you know, so we extended the tailgating parking lot times, you know, and, and initially, you know, there was pushback because you had the security, the police, you know, that were all going like, you're doing what? Yeah. But, you know, we just looked at it and said, you know, these fans are passionate. So let's speak to their, you know, quote, love language. And. And then if our product gets better on the field, you know, they will want to come inside. Let's give them a reason to come inside. It, it's so interesting. And I think so many, so many senior leaders, and, and maybe this is changing over the course of time, but I still think there's a lot of senior leaders in the college athletic space that have this mentality of, if we win, the fans will come up and they'll, they'll come to our games. And no matter what, winning is all we need to do. And the reality is you got to have a great product on your field and win, a winning team is your great product. But I think about it from an experience standpoint, Apple has a great iPhone, but there's a reason they spend a lot of money on the box. There's a reason why they spend a lot of money on their marketing, because they know that a great product is not it alone, or that a great product alone is not what's going to keep your customers coming back time and time again. Oh, um, absolutely. And so, you know, if you were to go back and look at the graph of our season ticket sales, I mean, it, it is growing steadily as we've invested in the box. And so, you know, it wasn't, you know, you could look at it and go, oh, that's just because they're winning now and what's going to happen. We'll go back six years ago when we were two and nine and we still had 40,000 season ticket holders, you know, so, you know, we were breaking records, you know, continually each year, even though we weren't winning, but we had improved the box. Well, it's, it seems like to another strategy that you guys use, and I'm trying to think of things that other people that are listening to this can take away from. And I think something that you said was really interesting, which was let's figure out what is it that our fans want? Do they want to stay till Sunday with an R with the RV lot? Do they want to come in a day early? Let's adapt our experience to fit the needs and wants and desires of our fans, as opposed to telling our fans, you should enjoy our experience in this way. We're going to adapt to them because at the end of the day, they're the ones spending money, giving us revenue so that we can put back into the student athletes experience. So I love that you guys had that flexibility. Well, I mean, it's so true. And, you know, as I travel around the Big 12, we, we joke about this because if I go to TCU or I go to Oklahoma State, mm -hmm. I mean, they have suites and club seats. 
you know, well beyond what we have and charge per cap a lot more than we do, but they have empty stadiums. And then, you know, they, and so I go there and I'm jealous because I'm thinking, gosh, I'd love to be in Boone Pickett Stadium where you have a hundred and some suites that people are paying 75 to a hundred thousand dollars, you know, and I've got 47 suites and they pay $50,000, right? But then if you talk to the administrators at TCU or Oklahoma State, when they come to our place, they look and go, wow, how come you have all these people in the stands, right? And, you know, like we can't, we can't print tickets fast enough for people to be in the stands, but, you know, they're not the type of people that are going to go want to sit in expensive, you know, really tripped out club sections or suites. And so you do have to identify what is your fan base? Well, you know, what do they want? And, you know, we did the end zone club and, you know, we toured and looked at a whole bunch of places. And in the end, what we came back to was the, it was a price point because the seats were in the end zone that we knew we couldn't charge, you know, as much. Number two, we had to charge enough to be able to afford to actually bowl in the end zone. But what we found is there was a group of fans that, you know, they were the, the middle-aged high earners that mm-hmm. had kids in soccer that didn't have time to tailgate anymore. So they were looking for their tailgate in a box. And so what we decided in our club section was I use the, we call it the Buffalo Wild Wings syndrome. If you go into our club area in the end zone, it's concrete floors, high exposed ceilings, feels very sports bar like. And, and so we were able to price that point, you know, where if I went to, again, some of my peers in the big 12 that, you know, they bowl in their end zones and it's like the Taj Mahal's and, and, but they can sell that because that's what their yeah. fans want. That's not what our fans wanted. It, it, it's huge. I mean, you can't market and create experiences for your whole entire audience and say, one size fits all. It doesn't work anymore. Right. And I think as, as there becomes more and more content and experience out, experiences out in the world that are really unique to what we want as an individual. I mean, you look at Netflix's content. The content that you see on your Netflix page is totally different than mine. And it's serving it up because it knows Netflix knows you really well. And so I think as, as we look at our events on game day, that is a form of entertainment. And if we're not being really specific and creating unique experiences specific to the fan base and the segments in our fan base, the niches in our fan base, we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot, expecting everybody to enjoy the product in the same way. I totally agree. And, you know, and I'll use another example of this. Um, so alcohol sales, you know, throughout mm-hmm. a stadium, right. And a lot of places have, you know, m- more people have moved into that space in the last, you know, two to three years. But if you look at most of those situations, they're places where they're struggling for attendance. So they were doing everything and anything to kind of create a margin that would allow more fans to come. And, you know, our friends on the other side of the state opened up this year that they were going to do alcohol in Kinnick Stadium. And of course, you know, that raises a lot of questions about, well, are you going to do it in Jack Trace Stadium? And, you know, what I'd contest is they needed to do it because they were seeing attendance slide. And, you know, they were having empty seats where five years ago, the thought of having empty seats in Kinnick, you know, you would have right. never seen. We haven't done a flat out survey, but anecdotally talking to our fan base, they don't want it throughout the stadium. They mm. just, they feel like, People have access to, to tailgate. We still allow pass outs out of the stadium. And when I mean pass outs, I don't mean you pass out because you had too much to drink. We right. allow you to pass out at halftime and come back in. We allow the sales in our premium areas, but that's part of, because it's a controlled environment. And number two, it's, it's a niche for kind of the country club membership. You know, we make more money off of the, the fee you pay to be in that section than the alcohol you buy. But what it comes back to is if you asked our fans, and I know if we ever had to just flat out ask them, the majority of the people are going to say, don't sell it in our stadium throughout the entire stadium, because that's not what we want. And our friends at Kansas State, they did it a year ago, and then they changed it this year, because after doing it for one year, their fans said, no, we don't want it in here. It's, it creates an environment that's not who we are. It, again, goes back to knowing your fan base. That's where for part of this, it's like great that you have these national surveys, but you ultimately have to know your specific fan base. 
Like we uh, at, at Penn State right now, we've kind of helped them over the last year set up a consumer insights division. We're running surveys all the time and a lot more decisions now are being based on data, but they're really being based on how can we better understand the uniqueness of what a Penn State fan wants. And we're finding all sorts of interesting things that don't line up with a lot of national surveys about our fans, just like the examples that you gave. Right. Um, That's so important. And, you know, it, 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 I mean, it's easy to sit here and say that's what we've done because it's worked, but, but truly that's, you know, that's what we did. Now, whether it was not going to take credit, I'm saying we were so intentional to do that. Um, it feels like we were intentional, but, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes you get lucky and you can look back and, you know, and then, and then see the roadmap you followed and go, wow, we were brilliant. But I, you know, we were, we were maybe more lucky than brilliant. Fair, fair enough. Well, let's talk about your new role as NACTA president for 2021 and 2022. Um, talk to us about the, the role of this kind of NACTA presidency and what are some of the goals that you have for the organization and for the membership over the next year? Well, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, it's a huge honor, but it's a huge responsibility. When I look at, um, I mean, literally, I look at the letterhead that NACTA uses and on the left-hand side of the letterhead, they list all the people that have ever served as president. And I think back to, you know, David, you know, the first time we met, you know, at an active event down in, you know, Marco Island. But, you know, my wife and I got engaged in 1992 in Marco Island at a NACTA event. Um, and when I look at that list, you know, I, I just feel this huge sense of responsibility to not only the organization, but to our industry, because mm -hmm. the people that are on that list are pillars that, as I was coming up through the ranks, you know, I looked at them as just the thought leaders and the, the people that, you know, really represented our institu or our institutions and our industry the way I thought they should be. And so, you know, now it's, you know, my turn. And so I take that as a huge sense of responsibility to the people that came before me, but also to all the people that are going to come after me in this industry. And so, you know, so then, then you go, okay, well, what difference am I going to be able to make in my one year? You know, and, and quite frankly, in that one year's time, you know, it, the difference you probably make is more your time as an officer, which is a five-year um, mm -hmm. term, because the one year that you're actually in charge, in fairness, you, you know, you're the figurehead that they put out there on the stage. And um, although I will say, you know, um, assuming things continue on the path they're on, you know, I will get to be the president for the first ever NAC dunk at in Las Vegas. And True. and the first one that's going to be live in the last three years since the last two were virtual. So um I do take a lot of responsibility for that one too, that we need to get it right. And I and I do believe um, you know, that uh there'll be this surge of a lot of people in our industry that are gonna want to attend. But it is also a big part of my role is just working with the, the NACTA staff. I mean, they've got about 20 staff members led by Bob Vecchioni and Pat mm -hmm. Manick that do an incredible job of uh, being a resource to the thousands and thousands of professionals that work in college athletics, not only at Division I, but at Division II, Division III, at AI, Junior College. And so helping them um, stay focused on what they should stay focused on. Um, making sure you continue to prop them up and, and keep them inspired because, you know, they're all making individual differences and imprints on so many different young people that are currently in our profession. And, you know, a big part of the NACTA office is just staffing all the professional organizations that uh, we have within the NACTA umbrella. And that is so important because those are the people that are on the front lines that are with the marketing people, the development mm -hmm. people, the events people, the licensing, college business, you know, um, sports information staff. And so, you know, being a thought leader for that professional staff is really important uh, because they can be on a little bit of an island. You know, their office is in for Cleveland. Sure. They're not on campus. And so by bringing the campus perspective to them, I think is really important. No doubt. I, one, one of my biggest gripes with NACTA, though, I've got to, I've got to share this with you. I, I talked to Bob about this before. So I, I want to hear your take on it is sometimes I feel like in college athletics, we get too insular and we're just talking to each other. Now, when you go D1, D2, D3, NAIA, there's a lot of differences. There's a lot of similarities. There's a lot to be learned across 
uh, across the platforms. But I feel like sometimes we're, we're, we're too insular as college athletics. And so I'm, I'm curious as to your take on thought, thought leadership outside of NACTA or not, not, not outside of NACTA, outside of college athletics, bringing that in through NACTA. Do you feel like there's that responsibility within NACTA or do you feel like NACTA is more so a, the, the place to share best practices amongst each other? I mean, t- talk to me a little bit about how you view that specific uh, well, I that mean, that's thing. really, that's really good feedback. I hadn't heard that before, but that's, that's excellent feedback. Jamie, um, I'm also super biased. <laughs> uh, well, but you know what? It's, it's, um, I always say, if that's what you believe, that is reality, right? And it's reality for you. So it, it's not bias. It's just what you believe. And, um, so that's good feedback to have. I mean, uh, again, I haven't thought about it and, but it's something that maybe we do need to think about. I, I can see your point of that. We, you know, I, I understand why it gets very insulated because, For sure, you know, people, even within the neck umbrella, people stay kind of in their silos unless they think they want to be an AD and then they try to cross pollinate. You know, I, I think back to when I was in the camera silo, you know, I didn't really get in the neck silo, the neck silo or any of the others, because, you know, I, that's who I was hanging with camera. Now, mm-hmm. I do think we have a responsibility as leaders, um, especially if you view yourself as being a thought leader for the industry, you know, to, um, to be aware of what's going not only inside, but outside. Um, I think the challenge, you know, like if I use myself, um, I mean, there's so many things coming at me as an athletics director that um, a lot of times, you know, I'll use NIL as a great example. I mean, if I got one, I got a hundred overtures from people that wanted just a 30 minutes to an hour of my time to talk about how they could help our institution with NIL. Well, I got, you know, newsflash here. If Jamie Pollard is spending, you know, a half hour with every one of those, our athletics department's going to get run over because no that's not what my, you know, responsibility is. But what my, but I do have a responsibility to make sure that our organization is aware of all those outside overtures. And again, as an organization, we're probably not going to be able to meet with them all, but you know, we, we've got to be aware they're out there. We've got to aware that we need to know what they are and, and implement them if we so need to implement them. And so I'll take your feedback as constructive feedback to our organization um, and see what I can do in my one year's time as leader <laughs> to uh, interject at least that thought process into Uh, uh, a much bigger, you know, wheel. Uh, Appreciate it. You got a hundred other things. I was just like, oh, I can't let it slip without sharing that. Um, No, but it's good. That's a good feedback because, hey, you know, look around. I mean, if we stayed in our silo, I mean, you could argue one of the reasons we're in the predicament we're in as an organization, whether it's NIL, you know, academic incentives with the Alston case, Mm -hmm. pay for play. I mean, pick your topic, right? And many of those topics are front and center right now because, you know, we had our head buried in the sand as an, as an industry and, and didn't want to deal with it. And and now people are dealing with it for us and we're, we're not liking how that feels. I totally agree there. And we could, we could do a whole podcast on that, but we got a bunch of other things to cover here. Um, one, one thing I, I can't, I can't let go. I gotta, I gotta make a sure I give a shout out here. You mentioned getting just hundred messages about different things. I mean, that, that's something that we saw as well from our time and it's a side service that I've got to make a plug for. We, we started creating, it's called enterprise solutions, where basically we've got guys on our team doing all those vendor calls for you. And when you, uh, have a question on something, you call us and you say, Hey, we've already sat down and done all those demos based on what you need. Here are the two to two out of the 20 to go do demos with, but you guys are getting messages from everywhere. So quick plug. Um, well, let's, but, let's hey, move, I think what you just said sounds like a really neat service. So make sure you get that to Nick so well, we can I properly will. embed it. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, let's talk about Big 12 a little bit here. Uh, obviously, you've got BYU, UCF, Cincinnati, Houston joining. What do you see as the biggest opportunities with those new members for Iowa State? Well, I, I would say two things. One, in the short term, it got us off being the punchline to every joke about the future college athletics, right? because is the Big 12 going to fold up or not? So, you know, in the short term, that solved a lot of that because we suddenly got to the other side of the wall and, and the AAC and the Mountain West kind of took over that space for us. Um, 
But what I would say, you know, just really thinking about this strategically, you know, if the future of college athletics television revenue is digital, and I think most would agree that that's, that is the future. Now, you know, none of us have figured out how to monetize it at the level that linear is monetized at, but let's assume for a moment that is the future. That would mean the future is based on activation, not on households. And if you're going to mm -hmm. be based on activation, then I want a lot of potential activators. Central Florida is the largest institution in the country with 70,000 students. They're Crazy. putting out 15 to 20,000 graduates every year that are potential activators. Cincinnati is 50,000 students. Okay. So they're going to be putting out and, you know, an inordinate number of potential activators. BYU, I mean, drop the mic. I mean, they already have the activators, right? I've told yeah. people, you know, we take great pride in the Big 12 about how the Kansas City Big 12 basketball tournament is like no other because Kansas, Kansas State, Iowa State, I mean, we, um, we backbone that tournament in a way that fans don't just buy tickets. They come to the games. It's sold out, even the first yeah. round games on Wednesday night. BYU, I guarantee you, will take over Kansas City because, I mean, their their followers are about as rabid as they come. That's right. You know, so, um, and I, I can't speak to Houston as an institution as much as comparison to just Central Florida and Cincinnati's demo, but the city of Houston, you know, totally changes Massive. the landscape for the Big 12. So we went from being in households of 39 million to now we're in households of 70 million. And I get it that someone's going to go, yeah, Jamie, but Cincinnati doesn't carry the Ohio market. Ohio State does, and Central Florida doesn't carry, you know, but they will when it comes time to activate from a digital standpoint. And so I think that's a huge upside to us that not a lot of people are focused on that should be focused on. I totally agree. I mean, even just talking about it now, the way that we're talking about it, it's like in, in my head, it, it's just very clear. Why weren't these guys power five, if you will, beforehand? Because from a school profile, they fit really well with the goals of the, the conference. So, um, Well, David, here's why they weren't. And, I, and I've said this many a time. You know, there was an artificial cut line. The cut line was at 65, right? Iowa State just happened to be above the cut line. Cincinnati, BYU, Central Florida, Houston were below the cut line. It had nothing probably really to do with their demographics because there's some schools below the cut line that have better demographics than teams way above the cut line, right? But it was just circumstantial. That's just where they were, and that was their lot in life. And so, you know, I, I'm excited for them because now they're going to be above the cut line, but it doesn't make them any better than, you know, Colorado State or SMU or somebody that's still below the cut line. Though, you know, they're institutions that have alums, that have homecoming you know, they have foundation events, you know, they have great environments. It's just, you know, this artificial line was drawn. And so, um, so I'm happy for those to come above versus others sliding back. Yeah. I, and I'm excited for what they can do because again, like you mentioned, a lot of rabid fan bases now that are going to be in the conference. And I, I think it's going to be a win for everybody. So excited to see what happens there. Well, let, let's transition topics a little bit and get into kind of our leadership talk. So at Engagement, we do a lot of work with culture, customer service, but so much of that comes from the leader and the way that the leader leads the organization. We can go in and do as much training and process changes, but at the end of the day, the leaders aren't carrying it through, it falls short. So I want to talk a little bit about your leadership style. Uh, so here we go and let's jump into this section. Who is your favorite leader you've ever worked for? And what were some of those elements that you loved about their leadership style that you've incorporated into your own? Well, I, really quickly, I, I would kind of rapid fire through this. The three of them had big impact on me in, in different ways. Debbie Yao is the first person that I worked for as an athletics director. And Debbie administered like a basketball coach. She'd been a three-time women's basketball coach that took programs to the top 20. You know, when you were an associate AD for Debbie Yao, you were like an assistant coach. You had to work like a dog. And, you know, that you work seven days a week, nonstop. I mean, she was calling you at 10 o'clock at night. I mean, you better know your stuff. But she gave a lot of young people a lot of responsibility, mm. but she held you accountable. And some people couldn't handle being held accountable. And, you know, I came from an environment as a, you know, a track cross-country athlete where what you put into it, you get out of it. So I'm used to being held accountable. And so I thrived working for her. There were people that didn't. 
you know, because they couldn't handle that volume and they couldn't handle the accountability. But that's what I learned from her is just, you gotta, you know, you gotta get after it. You gotta give people responsibility, but you gotta hold them accountable, okay? Second person was Pat Richter, who hired me at the University of Wisconsin. And, you know, Pat was, you know, in a lot of ways, he was, you know, he's a non-traditional uh, AD. He had come from Oscar Mayer as human resource, but he was mm. a legend. I mean, he's the Big Ten Medal of Honor. He was, a, you know, lettered in three sports at Wisconsin. He played in the NFL. Um, you know, in some ways in Madison, Pat could do no wrong. But what Pat was is he was so regal, and he really taught me, you know, that you can have family and do this. Because Pat found a way to not get so caught up in all the hysteria. You know, he was just, you know, people loved him and he could have taken all the credit, but he was about as humble as you could ever be. Um, I have the utmost respect for him because he just taught me, he gave me like an inner calmness to say, Mm. you know, make family first, do your job. And, you know, you don't need to brag about your job. Let your job do its talking. Okay. And then thirdly was the chance to work for Coach Alvarez. You know, and, and I think that was kind of the, the final piece was, you know, just really being able to get a feel for, you know, how does a football coach think and what do they think about the administration and, and how do they, what they do as a coach apply to what we do as administrators? You know, and, and one of the things I took from Barry is don't be afraid to make a decision. You know, if you think about mm-hmm. it, football coach is making a decision every play, right? And right? Not every play is a touchdown. Yet the fans are like, why are we running the ball? Why are we throwing the ball? Right. You know, and so as a football coach, you just couldn't be paralyzed by the moment. You just got to be able to work your way through the moment and um, and next play, right? Next play. And so that was a piece that was really helpful. So I've kind of put all three of those together, Dude, David. I love it. Uh, so many things to unpack there, but I know we're we're short on time, but I, I do want to un- unpack this a little bit. When we when we think about holding people accountable and and really making sure that they're on, and they, they're they completing their tasks, they're getting everything done that they need to, mixed with this balance of having family and combining those two things together, are there certain rules that you have set in fast for helping to manage that balance? Because I think in today's day and age, especially coming out of the pandemic, where people may have spent more time with the family than they ever did before, and they placed more value on that because they remembered, I actually like my family, right? I, I, I have a dog and I like that dog or whatever it might be. Um, are there certain rules that you have for helping to keep that balance between the two or manage that balance? Well, I think if you were to ask anybody in our department to describe our culture, I'll bet you 90% of the people, the first thing they would say is we've created a culture that says family first. Okay. Mm. Now that does not mean family first at the expense of your job, you know? And so what I always say is, you know, I've got three priorities in my life. Doesn't mean I have other things I don't enjoy doing, but I've got three priorities, my family, my work, and my faith. But I can't tell you, and I'm just going to be honest and say, you know, most people would go faith, family, job, right? Because that's the PC order. Right. What I tell you is I can't put them in order because on any given day, one could trump the other. My family benefits from my job. So there's going to be times my job needs to come first. But there's other times when I can, I need to put family first. And, and then, you know, I'd all, we'd all like to say our faith is first, but you know, you know, that's the, you know, that's the sheer definition of sin, right? Is that, you know, all of us have sins. And so, um, but I think you need a good faith foundation to just, you know, to be able to see your way through things. Um, And so I think what our staff would tell you is we're, we're a family first organization, but what that means is the job's got to get done, but there are many times you know, that you don't, you know, absolutely have to be there. We've got other people that could be there. You may be choosing to be there because you're putting your ego first and putting you first ahead of your family. And so, you know, I've, I've called people on it before where someone tells me, oh yeah, you know, my son had their first soccer game, but you know, I missed it. Cause I had, and I said, you did what you missed the first time your son played soccer because you know, what were you doing? You know, yeah. well, I had this and I'm going, you, we didn't have anybody here that couldn't have done that for you. So you could be there for that first time. And I think that, that, that culture is really rubbed off. Now, practically speaking, how do you make that happen? Cause that sounds, you know, you know, mm-hmm. that sounds great, but you know, now put it into application. So my staff knows, I mean, my assistant knows, I mean, I, I'm anal about putting family things on my calendar way, 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 way in advance. All right. And the reason I do that is so when David calls me to ask me, Katie, 
are you, can you do this? You know, if my son or daughter had an event today, I wouldn't be here doing this with you. But we made sure we Love scheduled that. at a time that I could do both, right? Yeah. But, you know, we could, I could fill up my calendar with all this kind of stuff and have no time left for family to fit in. And so I describe it as a big ball of yarn and all the yarn is intertwined in a way. You can't pull any one color apart from the other. It would be just, you know, yeah, good luck, right? But you, you know, there is a limit to the colors of yarn you can put in that ball. That physical description of a yarn, I've never heard that a ball of yarn is so much better than work-life balance, if you will, because I think of that oh, as almost being on two there different is no scales. There is no work-life balance. I, not in this industry, not in this industry. Well, there, let's there keep rolling. Not, I mean, if, when someone says that to me, I always go, okay, there's a phony. They don't have, I mean, they don't even know what it is when they say I've got work-life balance. There, it, it's, I mean, the scale will be out of balance all the time. But it doesn't mean it always has to be work that's got it out of balance. No, and, and I think something that you hit on too is uh, really making sure that as a leader, you're holding people accountable. You're not just saying, yeah, put family first and then praising someone for working hard and missing their soccer game, right? You're holding them accountable to making sure that they're keeping, keeping track of all their colors of yarn, if you will. Well, let's, let's keep rolling here. Um, I, describe a, a high point and a low point in your career as a leader. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, to me, the low points are pretty easy to point out whenever we got to make a personnel decision. And, mm. and why I say that is um, we're humans. I mean, the day that a personnel decision isn't a low point for me is the day I need to exit stage right. Yeah, because agreed. you're impacting, even if the person deserves to be let go because they've really messed something up or they've done something unethical, you're impacting someone's life. You're usually impacting a spouse. You're impacting children. You know, you're impacting people. And um, and so, you know, and then then couple that with when you've got to do one that's, a, you know, a, you know, a high profile coach mm. because it's public and now it plays out in the public. And so, you know, I've had several of those low moments, whether, you know, it was Coach Rhodes or, you know, Coach Pro, you know, just think Coach, you know, McDerm just thinking back in time to some of the coaches, um, th those are... Um, those are they the low heavy. ones, without yeah. a doubt. Okay, about, high points? High point, yeah. Give me high okay, points. Okay, I'm going to give you two because um, one's kind of a little personal, but the first one would be the day Iowa State beat Oklahoma State here on that Friday night and knocked Oklahoma State out of the BCS. And, and why that was so neat, it was one of the first times anything like that had ever happened at home in Jack Trice Stadium where – everybody can say they were here for it and took the field. And now there'll be thousands of people that will say they were here that weren't here, but you know, good things sometimes happen and it's on TV or it's somewhere else, but it happened here. And it was just like, I was so happy for all the fans that they got to be part of something maybe that they thought they would never see. The other one for me is just personal. Um, you know, my son was a really good runner and his freshman year, he took uh, quote the Olympic year. And he, um, he made the U S world team and got to go to Poland and wear the red, white, Congrats. and blue and compete in Poland in the 10 K and my wife and I got to go over there. And so it was, it's just one of those moments that anybody that's ever have a kid in the Olympics or gets to compete at that level, you can't appreciate being there and hearing the stars and stripes. And it's just, it, I mean, it just is goosebumps. It, it's incredible when any of our student athletes have that kind of success like that. It, it's another thing when it's your own son. Uh, Absolutely. How, how, how incredible. Um, all right. Well, I, I want to unpack your strategies for laying people off, uh, but we'll save that for another time, Jamie. We got too many other questions. So uh, yes. but let's go into how is a failure or an apparent failure really set you up for later success? We'll stick with this kind of low point theme, if you will. But do you have like a, a favorite failure that you've learned from? Well, you know, you learn so much more from your failures than you'll ever learn from your successes. Because most of the time with successes, everybody's telling you, you know, how great you are, right? And when you fail, people usually don't tell you, I mean, they, they sometimes tell you how bad you are, but they usually tell you why you're so bad, right? Where when you're good, they just praise you for being good. They usually don't get specific. And so when you have those failures, I think it's just an awesome time to look inward and, and ask yourself, you know, what did we do wrong here? What, what could we do better? How could we have handled this differently 
in order to, um, you know, to, to avoid that kind of situation going forward. Um, you know, and so, you know, I, I, I can think back to times, you know, I'll go back way, way back in time to St. Louis university, um, where, you know, we were moving to, um, from the Colt, the, um, Keel center to the checker dome. Um, and so we had to reseat everybody in basketball and we got this great idea on paper that we thought it was going to be so cool to have tag days where we put actual things on seats and then we let fans come in and like, you know, you just went selected your seat and you took your tag off and you went over to the little counter and you, you checked out and paid and, you know, it sounded really cool. It sounded like we, we've got this nailed, right? What we never, ever anticipated is the crowd mentality of dissatisfaction. So the mm. first couple people that came in, you know, they could pick any seat they wanted, right? But as people started to come in, you know, they got to see, well, how come all, I thought I was like, I thought I was number 20. How come all those seats are already gone? Oh, those are the seats we don't have available because of corporate sponsors. Or those are the seats we have held for this or for that. We let them see way too much of the recipe, right? Mm. And then crowd mentality took over. And what we thought was going to be a really cool customer service thing. I mean, it turned into a nightmare where we had to get the police just to escort us out of there because people were going to kill us. Right. And, and we had to go back and go, wow, what did we do wrong? And so we had to do it all over and start from scratch. And when we did it all over, we didn't have it like on a Saturday in the arena. We did it over like two months and you came in individually to the ticket office and you looked at a board and we walked you through it. And, you know, because we did, we, you couldn't afford the crowd mentality. And, but it was just one of those times where you think you got this awesome idea, but you didn't fully vet it and you mm. took it live too soon. And, you know, so what you learn from that is vet things a little more, you know, don't be so high on you think you got all the answers. Get some people that are going to be impacted by what you're about to do. And, you know, think tanks are helpful. You know, do some more research. Don't just think you got this nailed. I, I, I feel like you guys at Iowa State are a little bit more entrepreneurial than most athletic departments. And I think as an entrepreneur, oftentimes, I, I know this from our space, right? You've got to take risk and sometimes you've got to throw it out into the world and see the reaction. So how, how have you, is there, I mean, briefly, is there a way that you kind of managed not overreacting to that lesson and saying, well, now we got to make sure everything's vetted a hundred times before it goes out. Correct. How, how do you, how do you stay away from that? But also keep in mind the lesson that you learned from, from that experience at St. Louis. Well, um, you know, you, as the leader, you got to ask the tough questions then, you know, because you've got to rely upon your staff to create things. I think what happened in that particular situation is we didn't ask enough questions. Right. Mm -hmm. And okay. so I think you got, you got to ask questions. Um, but you also have to have a culture that, you know, you just nailed it. I mean, at Iowa State, one of the great things that we've got going for us is we may not have the most money. We may not have, you know, the, the same number of donors as everybody else, but we also don't have bureaucracy here. You know, we have a system, yeah. the way the regents are set up, the way our president administers, that we can get a decision in the morning and implement it in the afternoon if we want to. But, you know, we, you've got to ask the tough questions. I'm going to give you a great example from this past year. You know, so, you know, from COVID, we all jumped into digital ticketing, paperless yep. parking passes, right? Digital yep. this, digital that, right? And some of the angst is, you know, people just have to understand, you know, we're not going to use a rotary phone anymore either, right? <laughs> you know, there is going to be change. But um, I personally was just really concerned. I get in football when we, you know, digital ticketing, I totally get. Digital parking passes, I was a little more worried because I'm thinking of, you know, as cars find their way through the parking lots and now you got to stop every car instead of just waving them through because I can see your hang tag, I got to look at your phone, okay? Well, we've got it and we worked it through in football, but our staff was going to do it for basketball. And I, I just challenged them. I said, do you know for certain that those little machines are going to work when it's 10 degrees outside? Have you thought about what it's going to be like when it's pitch black? And you've got all these cars, you know, football, people come so early to tailgate, yep. but in yep. basketball, they all show up at the same time. So we're going to stop every single car and have somebody now in their winter coat, fumble for their phone, get their phone out. You know, you're going to have to stop every single car. And, and so what I, you know, I challenged our staff to say, I'm not telling you not to do it, 
But, but if we do it, I expect you're out there. Not you're not going to blame it on the company that we hire to do game management. You're going to be right. out there answering the questions because they're going to come to me if they're not happy. Well, lo and behold, yep. we're not doing digital parking. The staff decided we're going to do hang tags. So, you know, you got to you got to be strong enough to challenge them and be able to you know to see what could potentially happen. And it, it, it's an interesting and a specific difference asking the right questions versus saying I need to see the whole plan, right? Correct. And I and I think I think oftentimes that's where the mistake gets made is every senior leader has to weigh in and give their thoughts and see the whole plan versus asking the questions and making sure the person's already thought through it. So uh, I love the distinction. Uh, all right, a couple more questions before we wrap up here. An unusual leadership practice or work habit that you love. Oh, something I love well, that's unusual. Oh boy. Something, or, something, or something that you do. Well, something something uh, unusual something, I, that I'll, other I'll leaders don't do. I'll tell you something do. I do that I think our staff would tell you is really good. And I learned it from Debbie Young. And it's just a way to kind of make my workflow better is, so I'm not a big meeting person. I'm just not. Because okay. I, I think what happens is, you know, I hear people, oh, we meet this, we meet that, we meet that. Well, then you spend all your time just creating agendas. So yep. m- my senior executive team, you know, they get biweekly meetings with me, but it's their time. So what I expect them to do is they send me the agenda. I don't send them an agenda. It's their time. If you don't have anything, then we don't meet. But, you know, normally they do. But you send me your agenda ahead of time. You know, and so that's what we work off when we meet. I drop that in your folder. At the end of the year, then I'm able to go back and I can just flip through all those agendas really quick. It helps me really remember all the things we dealt with throughout the year. It helps me when it comes time for evaluations at the end of the year because, you know, I'm not sitting down and going, what did we do this past year? Well, I've got 26 records of it, right? Um, And so that's been a tool I used where, you know, there's no way if I had to, it would drive me crazy if I was setting the agendas for every one of those meetings every single time. I that's that's a great one. Uh, we do that as well here at Engagement, but we don't have them. We don't have our people do agendas for it, but it is their time. And now that I'm yep. thinking about it, I'm like I might be implementing agendas because that way you can go back and look through it and see all the different topics. Yep. I, it's I a love great that. scorecard. It's a scorecard, and and then it makes the end of the year because you know what? All of us say this. You know, two and evaluations of people. I mean, it really stinks. I mean, it's a time suck. Now, yep. it, it's it's really helpful to do that. But when you sit down to do it, it's like, where do I start? This is going to be a challenge. Well, for me, I start with those 26 agendas. I just flip through it and I go, I already got five, six things right there that I can say, you know what, David, you did a really good job in this, 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 and this. Do you remember when we worked on that? Katie just messaged me on the side. She's like, I hate agendas. Don't make us do that. I'm like, all right, well, maybe it's bullet points. We'll find a, we'll find a soft spot. Well, it's bullet points. It's bullet points, Katie. It's it's bullet points. Um, All right. Well, do you have, Jamie, do you have any other advice for uh, other senior leaders in the industry in sports and entertainment, whether it be pro or college athletics, any final words of advice uh, to give to our listeners? You got to, you have to, and this goes back to Debbie Al, uh, you have to empower your staff. You have to, and I should only be involved in a decision if it's 50-50. If it's 80-20, it's not a decision. Somebody should have made it already. And so I tell my staff, you know, if it lands on my desk and it's a layup, somebody's in trouble because that means they didn't do it and they let it land on my desk. I got to empower them to do it. That's how you That's how you develop future leaders. Debbie let me cut my teeth firing somebody, hiring somebody for the first time. Pat Richter did the same thing. You know, I did my first women's basketball search because Pat just said, do it, you know? And so you've got to trust them to do it. And um, I think oftentimes we don't do that because we're afraid to let let go. And you just have to trust them. I tell my staff all the time, if you do what you absolutely believe was the right thing to do, even if it's the polar opposite of what I would have done, I'm supporting you because that's what I empowered you to do. Because I know... If I do that, more often than not, you'll get it right. That might be my favorite piece of advice in our 90 episodes that we've had. That might be the fi- my favorite final piece of advice I've ever heard anybody give. I think it's so well needed in our world of college athletics, where a lot of times senior leaders want to weigh in on everything. It's looking at your role a little bit different, saying, how can we build other leaders? And how can I just be a tie break? Uh, how can I weigh in when it's really, really necessary? I love that piece of advice, Jamie. Well, D- David, I'll leave you the, this. I always tell, I love this answer because people ask me, Jamie, what, you know, you know, what time do the parking lots open on Saturday? You know, and I always yeah. joke and go, 
I don't know. I just work here. <laughs> but, 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 you know, the best answer you, I think the most, you know, when you can show vulnerability, I think you actually capture people because people yeah. don't expect leaders to be vulnerable. And so I think one of the best answers you can ever give is I don't know, but I'll find out. No doubt. And that is what we train and work with so many different universities on to kind of have that mentality. So great way to end us. Uh, Jamie, I'm really looking forward to our next conversation. This has been a, a great last hour with you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Katie. To anybody listening, thank you so much for joining us uh, and we'll see you next week. If you're focused on guest experience or employee experience, definitely go check out our email newsletter. As we work with pro teams and college athletic departments around the country, we're taking the lessons that we learn from our experiments and our projects, and we're putting those insights into the newsletter. A couple of times per week, you'll get everything from the articles and content that are inspiring us to innovate, as well as new tools that we're using and loving. If you get value from this show, you're going to love the newsletter. To sign up, head to engagementpartners.com backslash newsletter. Hey guys, before you head out, just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to the show. If you enjoyed it, head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. That helps more of your peers find the show as they search for ways to get better in their own roles. But this podcast is just a small part of what we do at Engagement. In our normal day in the office, we're crazy focused on helping athletic departments and sports and entertainment companies generate more revenue by becoming more customer-centric. To see how we might be able to help your organization, Visit engagementpartners.com to learn more. Download a free guide, check out our blogs and case studies, or schedule a call with us if you want to see how we can help with your particular objectives. Our goal is to help you create deeper connections with fans and generate more revenue. So when you're with us, hopefully you find a nugget or two that helps your cause.